Hello, and thank you for joining this OncLive TV Peer Exchange. This program features expert panel discussions with a focus on current and emerging therapies for the treatment of hematologic malignancies, specifically the myelodysplastic syndromes, or MDS, and chronic myeloid leukemia, CML. My name is Harry Erba, and I am a professor of internal medicine and director of hematologic malignancy program at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Mark Levis, Director of the Adult Leukemia Program and Associate Professor of Oncology, Medicine, and Pharmacology at the Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Elias Javor, Associate Professor, Department of Cancer Medicine at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Rami Kamroji, Clinical Director and Associate Member of the Department of Malignant Hematology at the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. Dr. Ruben Mesa, Chair, Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Rafael Behar, Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology from the University of California at San Diego. Thank you again for joining us, and let's get started. Let's begin this section with an overview of the current landscape and unmet challenges in the myelodysplastic syndromes. As you know, the myelodysplastic syndromes are a heterogeneous group of bone marrow failure syndromes that are characterized by bone marrow dysplasia and varying degrees of cytopenias. These patients have a tendency or a risk of developing acute myeloid leukemia over the years. The goals of our therapy in myelodysplastic syndrome are to improve the cytopenias and to delay the progression to uh, acute leukemia, and hopefully to improve the survival of our patients with myelodysplastic syndrome. We have a number of therapies that are currently available um, for these patients, uh, azacitidine, lenalidomide, and uh, decitabine. But before getting into that discussion, I would like to uh, turn to the panel and ask, what are some of the most pressing issues in the treatment of patients with myelodysplastic syndromes? Rafael, would you like to start? I think the, the issues that for facing patients with myelodysplastic syndromes begin at different levels. So there's an issue with what types of therapies we have to option. There's an issue with how we best predict the prognosis of patients, and even how we make the diagnosis. It's often a difficult diagnosis to make. One of the areas that I'm excited by is what we've learned about the genetics of these diseases and how they can help us at each of those stages. There are genetic abnormalities that might help us make the diagnosis, for example and other abnormalities that we can identify in the genetics that tell us something about the patient prognosis. Okay. Thank you. I want to add okay. to what Rafael mentioned about the diagnosis. Sometimes it can be difficult. It's a rare disease. Uh, we always uh, recommend and uh, ask our colleagues to refer this patient, at least for second opinion. We've seen around 16% of discrepancies between what was observed outside when, when they are referred to academic center, whether it's high grade or low grade disease, and definitely with the new genetic testing that can complement what we have and that can lead us to prescribe the best treatment available for this patient. I think that brings up a very important point because uh, you know, the, the grading of dysplasia in myelodysplastic syndrome varies between pathologists. And sometimes we have the difficult situation where the marrow is fibrotic and we don't get a good, good aspirate. So the question that I, I'm often thinking about is, should I be using our, the genetic information that we have learned in myelodysplastic syndromes to actually make the diagnosis or, as you said, Elias, complement the morphologic um, diagnosis? I think it's more a constellation of factors, starting with the clinic, with the biology, with the pathology, with the molecular markers. Uh, we should put all this together uh, when we see somebody and we want to have a plan of treatment. And, and I think the, the challenge for a while that those were not incorporated in the diagnostic criteria. So we used to see patients that clearly had, you know, cytopenias, but sometimes the dysplasia, as you mentioned, is subtle, not recognized, and they had cytogenetic abnormalities, but the WHO diagnostic criteria will not recognize them. Those got changed recently that you can call it provisional MDS, and now we are going into transitional zone instead of the common karyotype abnormality of cytogenetics, we are trying to incorporate the molecular changes. So we are in transitional zone in, in terms of how to incorporate all those, but I agree with the Elias point that I probably should incorporate all of those together to make the diagnosis. Harry, I would add in terms of other unmet goals, 
You know, as we look at our current therapies, and as you described in the introduction, I mean, we have two main axes of, let's say, response. You know, improvement in cytopenias, delay in disease progression, whether that's to AML or whether that's to death. And I think the, the fuel that, that fires us to, to try to incrementally have better options for these folks is really the suboptimal responders. So I think there are individuals that with hypomethylation therapy, we think they're doing better than not being on it. They probably have a survival advantage. They may have a delay to moving toward acute leukemia. But many of these are far from in an ideal state with their disease. Many have suboptimal response in terms of their cytopenias, so have some degree of transfusion dependence. So I think there, there remains real daylight in terms of opportunity to improve. It does not discount the benefits that they've had, but I think we clearly have room to grow in terms of the quality of the responses. I mean, I think, I think we're on the cusp of a whole new world. Mind you, that's an optimistic response, but we wouldn't be in this field if we weren't optimists. And I think molecular medicine is going to change the way this disease is diagnosed uh, over the next five to 10 years that ancient instrument called a microscope that we've been using for decades uh, is finally going to start to fade away in importance to molecular analysis. I think part of the challenge for also the practicing physician is, is this information or knowledge that we are putting out and how to incorporate that in practice. We now, when we see MDS patient, we talk about four or five clinical risk models, incorporation of a lot of genetic information, and what do we do with this information? You know, I think we've got better probably in prognostic or refining the prognostic value of those models, but many of those did not translate to how do we incorporate those into management of patient. Uh, short of probably recommending anogenic stem cell transplant for patients at higher risk, those all new risk mod models had not served as a predictor markers or predictors for response or how to tailor the therapy basically based on them. And, and that's a challenge. I think that's the key. I think the idea that the molecular genetics can help you in a clinical context has to be tied to the fact that there have to be molecular markers that predict some sort of therapeutic outcome. And we have that in other diseases like CML that we're going to talk about later. It would be really nice to have those elements in MDS. One of the ways we can get there is by having more therapeutic options, and I'm sure some of those will be tied to the genetics. So I think this is an area that's going to grow in the future. I want to add one more thing, uh, and Ruben mentioned, when we treat somebody with MDS, it's not only to avoid transformation to acute leukemia, because that is overreported. Transformation to AML is not 50, 70, 80 percent. Maybe it's high among patients with high risk, but still among patients with low risk, they fail treatment available, but they remain pancytopenic, and that is an unmet, unmet medical need. So transformation should be kept in mind. But it's not like the scary thing when I go into AML. Patients with MDS, they still die essentially from their MDS rather than transforming into acute mild leukemia.